It is. It is it? I'm seeing both. Now it is? I'm just going to my mouth into the wrong place. <laughs> All right. Let's ask God to bless the word, shall we? Father God, we come to you this morning, and once again, we want to thank you and praise you that we have opportunity to gather together as a group of like-minded believers. Father, we, we just pray that as we go into the Word now, that the Holy Spirit will guide us, direct us. Father, we pray that you might just touch our hearts and change our lives. We look for a blessing this morning, and we pray that the things we do and say in our life will bless you as well. We surrender to you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we finished up our look at what's known as the Lord's Prayer, okay? From Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and Luke 11, 1 through 4. And we began this study on prayer on May 1st of, of this year, just a few days before the National Day of Prayer. The National Day of Prayer, remember, is a call of all people in this nation to turn to God in prayer and meditation. It's a call for people of different faiths in the United States to pray for our nation and its leaders. Now, as we learn more about prayer, how to address our Heavenly Father, and that it's okay to talk to Him from our hearts, we're going to see more about that. Uh, so the question from that and, and the teaching we've had so far, do you think that prayer really matters when it comes to issues at the national level? We pray for our country, right? We're told in Scripture, the Lord commands us to pray for the leaders in that. Well, there's a couple of current events that have happened. The first one is the overturn of Roe versus Wade, okay? People here and churches have been praying that that would get overturned for nearly 50 years, just shy of 50 years. And it happened just the other day. The praying needs to continue for the state's to abolish it as well. Is prayer important? Absolutely. Does God hear us? Absolutely. But it's in His time, right? So we need we. It, it does work. There's a second thing uh, that happened. Uh, we're part. This ministry is part of the Alliance Defending Freedom, it's known as the ADF. And uh, what that is, it's like a think tank full of Christian lawyers, and, and that, and uh, they fight for our Christian freedom. Okay, whenever government or uh, the local people or whoever it is comes along and tells us you can't do that, they go to bat for us. We've been a member of that for a few years now. And occasionally I get a prayer list from them. They email it. And uh, I'll start posting it on the back and, and look for that. And uh, there's things to pray about. One of the things that was prayed about was this. I'll just read this thing. Through the Alliance Defending Freedom, which we are a member of, they're Christian lawyers who fight daily to protect our religious freedoms. Now, um, one example of that is, and I just want to give you an example, I'm not trying to make this a political thing, I just want you to see that God hears our prayers and things are working, okay? The Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the city of Boston violated the Constitution when it excluded a Christian flag from its city hall flagpole program. They had a program where, you know, the state flag and the United States flag and whatever other flags they had, and certain organizations were allowed to run their flag up another pole. They wouldn't let any of the religious organizations do it. So, here, uh, let me just read this from, from their email. It says, uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh had this to say in his concurring opinion. A government violates the Constitution when it excludes religious persons, organizations, or speech because of religion from public programs, benefits, facilities, and the like. Under the Constitution, a government may not treat religious persons, religious organizations, or religious speech as second class. Amen, huh? Yeah, a lot of people have been praying for that because that's what's been happening in the United States is this country and the, the unbelievers in that are walking farther away from God, they want less to do with it, and they don't want to see it, right? But that's unconstitutional. If they put anybody's flag up, they got to put the Christian flag up as well. So ADF responds to that saying this, we're praising God for this victory. 
a victory we advocated for through a friend of the court brief and lifted up in prayer by you, members of the ADF. So by extension, as being part of this ministry, you are a member of the ADF. And, and by praying for these things, that, that God, uh, Satan would get out of the way, the evil world that we live in today. So prayer, prayer is a tremendous part in these wrongs being righted. Amen? And Scripture tells us that we need to continue to do that. That, that God's Word would, would go throughout the land. That people would hear it and come to understand what's right and what's wrong. So, that's just examples of the power of prayer in, in the nation. And we pray for our nation. Like I said, Scripture uh, commands us to do that. But we pray for our, each other. And we pray for ourselves. And a lot of times, people will say, well, I'll pray for anybody in church. I feel really funny when I pray for myself about <laughs> stuff. Seems like a selfish thing. But it, that's not true. That's not true. And today we're going to look at an example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he prayed for himself. Okay? Um, Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. He showed them by example that it's all right to talk to God from the heart. But you have to remember, when this was all put together, uh, back in those times, it was under first century uh, Judaism, and the, the Jews had memorized different scripture, different prayers, and they just did them over and over again, and that was their way. And, and Jesus was teaching that it's not necessary to do that, that it's okay to just talk to God about what's on their heart. The empty phrases and prayers that are memorized and repeated are okay, but they're not what God the Father wants from us. He wants to hear about the daily needs that are on our hearts. So as we, we struggle with that, we're able to put that forward to Him. There's an example in Scripture, if you turn with me to John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Remember when we started this, and I mentioned the Lord's Prayer in Matthew and Luke. A lot of people say that's the disciples' prayer because Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray. And there's even things in the, the, that prayer that talks about righting our wrongs there, right? Taking care of our trespasses and that. And uh, um, we know that Jesus wasn't praying that because he didn't do any trespasses. And Jesus didn't have any sins where he wronged anybody. This is known as the high priestly prayer. Jesus at this point in time is, he's been teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God and preparing to leave them to go through the crucifixion, the resurrection, and then the ascension back to the Father. So he's been preparing them for that. And in the uh, beginning of, or the, excuse me, the ending of chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus tells them this. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So it's, he's let them know that he gives them a final note of encouragement. And we have to be encouraged today by the things that Jesus is teaching in the world. He says uh, to, take, to, uh, to take heart means to have courage, to be enthused. Jesus is saying, I got this, no matter what's happening. You're not alone in this walk. So this prayer, now that we're going to look at this part of the study, the prayer we're going to be looking at is actually in three parts. Jesus prays for himself in verses 1 through 5. Second, Jesus prays for his disciples at that time, verses 6 through 19. And then Jesus prays for all believers, which includes us, in verses 20 through 26. This prayer, if it's studied properly and presented properly, reveals much more about the beautiful, special relationship between Jesus and the Heavenly Father. It's about the relationship. So today we're going to take a look at part one of this um, and this is uh, chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, beginning at verse 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, 
the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have get, you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, to the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, just diving into the verse one. After Jesus finished talking to the disciples and encouraged them, it says he lifted his eyes towards heaven. Okay. Today, we often bow our heads when we pray and reverence and that, and, and that's fine. We, we need to, we've been taught through the study that we need to approach God with awe and reverence and, and fear, and, and to do that, we do it by submitting that way. But in first century, the Jewish culture, the common prayer posture was standing with your eyes lifted towards heaven, and it signified two things. The first, that the person praying acknowledged God's place in heaven, sitting on the throne. He is our heavenly Father in his throne room, on his throne. The second thing is that the person praying is coming to God with a clean and pure heart, not afraid to face God or look him in the eye. And there's many scripture references. Uh, Psalm 121 in verse 1 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And then in Psalm 23 and verse 1 it says, To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. And in, in Daniel uh, chapter 4 and verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar, remember he was all about himself and he kind of gone a little bonkers and God put him out in the field to graze with the animals and that. And verse 34 it says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. He, he paid attention to his heavenly Father. In lifting his eyes at this point that we're at now in the scriptures, Jesus turns his attention from the disciples who he's been, been teaching and talking to and praying with, he turns from the disciples to God, the heavenly Father, the attention and focus move from them to God. And he goes on to say in the scripture, the hour has come. Father, the hour has come. Now, some of, some of your translations will say, or his time had come. Because what it means is his time of suffering had come. Up to this point, a lot of what Jesus did, other than with the, the specific group of disciples, he kept quiet about. He did not run around bragging, I am the Messiah that you've been waiting for. I have come to take care of all issues. It's not like that at all at this point. So now, though, that time has come. That time has come. He prays that the will of God will be done in his life. He acknowledges that God's plan appointed in eternity past, it says before the world came to be, it, uh, it's ready to be carried out at this point. Now, John's Gospel speaks of many times that Jesus either said or escaped his, because his time hadn't come. John chapter 2 In verse 4, at this point, there's a wedding in Canaan, right? And, and most of you know the, the biblical account. The wedding's going on, and they run out of wine. And uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, comes to him and says, you need to help with this. It's a very uncomfortable social situation for my friends and, and all that. And Jesus responds to her and says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And in verse 7 of John's Gospel, there's several in verse 7. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 7 and verse 6. Chapter 7 and verse 6. Jesus is talking to his brothers. There's a feast going on. And, and his brothers say to him, why don't you go to this feast? 
and claim the honor that you say you have. Because we have to remember, Jesus' brothers thought he was a little cuckoo because he was walking around saying, you know, I, I'm the son of God, God, you know, I, Mary's my mother, Joseph's my stepfather, uh, I grew up around you guys, but I am the Messiah, right? And they thought he was nuts. In fact, the scripture says in one point here that they thought he was out of his mind, right? But his brothers say, mostly mocking at this point in scripture, why don't you go to that feast and claim the glory that you got coming there? And Jesus says to him in verse 6, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you when it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go to the feast. I am not going to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And in verse 8, we just shared that, okay? In verse 30 of chapter 7. So they were seeking to arrest Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But God wasn't ready for that to happen. Chapter 8 and verse 20. Jesus has been speaking again, and they're after him. And it says, These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. It wasn't time for the world to find out who he was and what he was about. So God protected him that way because he wasn't ready for it to happen. Jesus never presented himself as the Messiah. However, however, the time for his glorification has now arrived. And that's where we're at in the scripture today. And Jesus said that if the Father would glorify the Son in the crucifixion and the resurrection, the Son could, in turn, give eternal life to the believers and so glorify the Father. First, yeah. He could, he could glorify the Father giving us eternal life. God's kingdom grows that way. And that was God's plan. And he sent his son Jesus Christ to fulfill that plan. To put it into motion. And it wasn't an easy plan to do. So Jesus prayed in this prayer right now that the cross would bring glory to God. He prayed that the cross would bring eternal life to believers. And he also prayed that the Father restore him to the full rights and power as the Son of God. Remember when he left heaven. You know, uh, we're told in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And this speaks to what Jesus was asking at that time. Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has exalted, highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus gave all that up. And Jesus said in this prayer to the Father, I'll glorify you by doing your work. I glorify you by building your kingdom so other people are, are able to come to heaven that they're saved through that work. Because he paid the sin debt that was due. He gave up all the majesty, all the power, all the glory, everything that he had in heaven with the Father God prior to coming to birth, to earth through the birth of a baby. And Jesus said, it's time now. And we will do this together. Verse 2 of John chapter 17. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. That shows the amount of authority Jesus had been given in his incarnate or human state as he walked the earth. 
He was empowered to give eternal life to those the Father had given him. And we know that from John 14 and 6, right? Scripture says no one goes to the Father except through me, right? It's through Jesus that we get to know the Father. And uh, here in John chapter 6 and verse 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. See, the Father gives us to Jesus. You know, the desire that we have to get saved comes from God. We're not born with that. We're born with a sin nature. And as God works through the Holy Spirit in that, we hear people speak the gospel, and then one day we open our heart and we, we realize that's for me, right? I no, long, I no longer want to live the sin life I'm living. I no longer want to follow Satan in the world. I want to be with part of Jesus. I want to be known as a child of God. So that, that desire for that comes from God. He calls us to Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says, back to the original script. Verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ you have sent. That's the definition of eternal life. That we know God. The one and only true God. You have to remember in the times that, that this was written, there was a lot of idol worship. A lot going on. We still have idol worship today, right? People worship money, they worship new speedboats and fancy motorcycles and trucks and things like that. And, you know, anything that it comes before God in your life is an idol. And we need to not worship that. We need to worship and know the one true God. And we just seen in the scripture that nobody can get there without knowing Jesus Christ his son. And it's through him that we're able to get there. Eternal life means to experientially know God and his son Jesus Christ. Experientially, what does that mean? That means having a personal knowledge of the eternal God. A personal relationship. Eternal life is not about time. We talk about eternity, right? We all look forward to eternity when forever and ever and ever everything's going to be perfect and well, right? We'll never have no more sickness. We'll never shed another tear. We'll never have to say goodbye again. And we, and we always, not always, but most of the time, we look at it as a time span. But it is not. Eternal is about it, the relationship with God. It will be perfect. And how do we get that? We get that through Jesus Christ. And that's what he's asking the Father to help him to get us there. He says in verse 4, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. I've completed the task, Father. This verse right there reveals the perfect obedience of Jesus. Even though he hadn't been to the cross yet, that he speaks as though it's done. You sent me, Father. This is what you sent me to do. It's done. I'll take care of it. Sometimes we talk that way, don't we? Your wife will say, or your husband will say, I need you to do this or that. Done, just like that, right? <laughs> but Jesus said that to the Father. Don't worry about it, Heavenly Father. I've got this taken care of. It's done. That was his attitude. He knew that he could say no. Remember when he was in the garden? He prayed. And it was, it was a time of decision for Jesus. He could have said no, but he did not. What did he say? Thy will be done, not mine, right? I don't really want to suffer. I don't really want to go through this, but it's your plan, Father. You sent me here to do this, and I will do it. 
In John chapter 12, verses 27 to 28. This is as he's preparing still. Verse 27 and 28 of chapter 12 of John. Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Jesus did what the Father said, even though he didn't really particularly think it was a good idea at that point in time. It had become real at that point. But he went ahead anyway. In verse 5 of chapter 17, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Because of his finished work, Jesus prays that he will return to the union that he had shared with the Father before he came to earth. Remember, we've talked in the past about Jesus is eternal. Jesus is part of the triune God, right? The God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Been together for in eternity, forever. No beginning, no end, right? Not created, always been. And so, Jesus said, I want to be back there. I want to be glorified again. Uh, before the world was created. In John chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, I know what it says, but I want to read it uh, so you can see it and hear it. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. He's the Word of life. He's the Word God sent. And in verse 18 of chapter 1, it says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side has made Him known. The only God, if you look down, I'm using the ESV version, if you look down at the footnotes, It'll say the only Son is the Son of God. And so that would read, no one has ever seen God. The only Son who is at the Father's side has made him known. So did Jesus have his prayer answered? This is from his heart that he's talking to the Father. It's not about memorized prayers or any recital. He's praying about himself. This Father, I'm willing to do your will. I'm willing to be obedient and accept whatever you send my way. But Father, I, I want to be back with you. I want to be glorified. And isn't when we think about paradise, when we think about our eternal glory, isn't that what we're thinking about? Is to be glorified in a body that's not dying every second that we're breathing but we won't have to worry about that. So did the Father actually answer his prayer after he went through the trials, after he went through the crucifixion and the resurrection, which we so greatly praise for in, in that, right? And then he set, ascended back to God in Acts chapter 7 and verse 56. Acts chapter 7 and verse 56. This is when they're stoning Stephen to death, right? This is even before Paul's day in God's kingdom. Because at this point, he is Saul, and Scripture tells us that he's tending their cloaks. He's holding their coats while they're stoning Stephen to death. And Stephen, the Scripture says, as they were stoning him, and he said, Stephen said to the men that were stoning him, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen seen as the, as the heavens open, the Son of Man is Jesus Christ, glorified, standing at the right hand of God. So Stephen's dying words give us proof that his prayer was answered. He returned to his exalted position at the right hand of God. Now we know from all the studies we've been through together in that, 
that the right hand of God is a very high honor, right? That uh, uh, if it's the king, the person who sits at his right hand is being exalted. Not just everybody gets to sit there. Usually the queen's at the left hand. It's an exalted position. And, and Stephen seen, he was given that vision because he was obedient, taking the stoning instead of denying God and Jesus Christ that day. That Jesus was there and he was glorified at the right hand of God. Amen. So what can we take away from this today that, that we can take out into our world? It's okay to talk to God about us. It's okay to tell God, Father, to glorify you, I need to be better. Help me do that. Help me have a testimony that's solid and true as I walk through my life in the world. Help me to have the world, the words to share with the world why I have such joy and trust. And he'll help us with that as we seek to glorify him. But the scripture also teaches us that in order for this to happen, we have to go through Jesus Christ and we have to know who the Son is. We've just seen that here today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you are not connected to the Son, you will not get to the Father. That's a fact throughout the scripture. We're told that. One way. Not, Jesus does not say, I am one of several ways. Or I'm the easiest of all the ways. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you are not sure that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is a perfect time to do that. A perfect time. If you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. I would ask you to say this prayer with me. It's a simple prayer of faith. Just give your heart to Jesus. Pray along with me. If you know our Savior today. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I live an evil life following this world. And Father, right now, I ask for your forgiveness. Father, I repent of the way that I live. I turn from that. And I seek to follow you. I seek to follow the example of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be my personal Lord and Savior. I truly believe that you are the Son of God. I accept by faith your finished work on the cross of Calvary. I need you to be the manager and controller of my life. Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me. Father, I thank you for loving me and sending your son to pay that debt that I owe today. I thank you for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, I want to be the first to welcome you to the family of God. But it is the beginning of a journey. It's not the end of the destination. And this journey takes the rest of our life that we're here, reading and studying God's Word. Being gathered together with a group of like-minded believers like this and learning from them and their example as they're more mature in the faith. That's what it's about. And as we glorify Jesus Christ through our life, through our speech, through our prayers, the Heavenly Father is glorified. And one day in turn, we will be glorified. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today, and Lord God, we